This is David Bateson. This is Sissy Jones. This is Steve Downs. And you are listening to the Xbox Expansion Pass. The Xbox Expansion Pass. The Xbox Expansion Pass. Welcome one, welcome all to episode 79 of the Xbox Expansion Pass, recorded on Sunday, April 25th, 2021. I am your host, Luke Lore, the Insipid Ghost. In this episode, I'm joined by guest co-host Sean Capri of the Xbox Drive to discuss xCloud's arrival to iOS and PC, as well as the increase in mindshare for Xbox around the industry. In the back half of the episode, industry activist and developer Rama Ismail joins me to discuss equity among developers, the plight of indie developers around the world, and his experiences in bringing games to the market. Enjoy. Yet another week of gaming is upon us and behind us. Welcome to XEP, discussing all things in the Gamerverse as they pertain to the Xbox ecosystem. And as I am wont to do each and every week, I want to start the show by offering words of kindness to those who have made my gaming week better. And this week, the words of kindness go to the guest co-host, Mr. Sean Capri oh. of We The Gamer Cast, The Xbox Drive, and probably a thousand other shows. Sean Capri, <laughs> welcome to XEP. Thanks for having me on, man. This is this is momentous, I feel like. This is a... This is a moment, and um, I also feel like maybe one of the reasons that, um, that I've been invited on the show is Mr. Babbitt from the Trophy Room has been a little, maybe maybe too mean to you lately, so maybe you need a maybe you need an ally in the fight against Mr. Babbitt. Mr. Babbitt, Joseph Moran, is the worst. He's yeah. just the worst. He brings <laughs> down every show I'm on. He brings down Cast Co-op, and then if we guest on the same show simultaneously, it's, it's just the worst. And He's you real are mean here. to you. He, he's real mean, but, but he smells. So it's like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Mm. Sean Capri, you are here because for far too long we have not collaborated. Mm-hmm. And I got my start in the Xbox-specific podcasting realm over on the Xbox Drive, of which you steward. And uh, that show has continued to grow since, since my departure to incredible realms. Your Patreon is doing incredible. And uh, you continue to spread good vibes all around the internet. So it was long overdue that we collaborate once again. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. Against all odds, it seems. Um, I don't know. It's it's a strange it's a strange world, but I'm very very grateful. There's a lot of people who support both of us, and um, yeah, it's been a while, man. So I'm I'm glad to be here, dude. Appreciate it. Same, same. And I would imagine those people are going to be ecstatic because you are a secret. I kept it a secret. And I uh, was I almost blurted it out, and I'm like, I don't know if Luke wants me to to share this, but I was going to do some sort of. I was thinking about what the pun would be for like to drive over to the expansion pass, or I don't know. I was trying. I, I couldn't even think of it, so I was going to blurt it out though. Well, once this is out into the ether, we'll 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 be all sorts of punny, as it were. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it'll be good, and I hope that people enjoy this episode. And for anyone listening, in the back half of the episode, we do have Remy Ismail, who's going to be sharing an extended interview. It's a it's a good long interview after I was uh, absent for last week, so you guys get a big old bonus episode. Sean and I in the first half, and then Remy Ismail in the second. Oh goodness, Sean, uh, let's get to the news, my friend. Okay. All right, my friend, we have plenty to talk about here in this episode. Game Pass subs, Xbox free-to-play is actually free-to-play now. There's more FPS boost news coming through, and who knows who can be uh, more ecstatic than than the iPhone users as xCloud has arrived to their devices. And let's start with that. Apple devices uh, are going to be getting xCloud in the none-too-distant future, and emails have already started rolling out. Uh, dude, I was so excited to get this because I have I like my wife has an Android device. Like we've got some tablets around the house, and so I've tried um, X Cloud before, but it hasn't really like made its way into my life. Really, I mm-hmm. think part of that is because I have an Apple phone, not an Android phone. But then mm-hmm. also the um, the PC thing is just so awesome. And people know me from when I play my Switch. Like there's 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 a special time for the Switch, Luke. And it's it's called toilet time. This is mm-hmm. this is where you can be instead of spending all your time on Twitter, you can get some some good old gaming time. Some and now boots. you can do it with your phone on XCloud, my friend. <laughs> you can play you can play games. And um, all jokes aside, 
I was saying to to Ryan on the on the Xbox drive, I think one of the magical things that I was not expecting out of this is the touch controls. Yeah, are kind of a big deal on the phone, man. Like they kind of they kind of make it like they make it even way more accessible. And I figured I would be turning my nose up against those uh, because who wants to play touch controls? I don't like mobile games, like all that kind of stuff. It mm-hmm. turns out it's kind of a game changer with uh, with the games that it, that are available for it right now. I will 100% support that sentiment. I've been fortunate enough to be playing xCloud on Android for a good while. And Mm. when it first started, I was very impressed. Uh, But then, you know, over time, they've really improved it. And now I'm impressed. You know, and like I think back to when it first started, I'm like, ugh, lesser than. And uh, as I'm playing on kind of an updated, uh, recently purchased tablet with touch controls, I mean, I'm playing Streets of Rage 4, and it's working perfectly. Perfectly. Wow, I wouldn't even Perfectly. think to try like that. You require twitch control. You, you require precision controls on that. Like your timing's exactly. got to be good. Mm-hmm. Exactly, and it's just it's just incredible how good it's getting. And so, I was ecstatic to find out that my my Apple brethren are going to be getting to play Xbox here, and I'm seeing more and more. I mean, in the early days of of xCloud coming to phones. We saw the Razer Kishi going out there and whatnot, but I'm mm-hmm. seeing more and more people pick up uh, little, you know, add-on devices where they can, you know, turn their phone into a mobile device, and it looks like a switch in some cases. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of people diving into xCloud, uh, especially with this new Apple announcement, and I genuinely think this is the game changer that is uh, not so, not so much a secret anymore, but it's going to be revelatory over the next few years. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because of all the the kind of the workaround that had to happen. But it was the same deal, I think, on PC as it is on iOS, which is it has to run in a browser, which Mm -hmm. is interesting. It's different than uh, than it is on Android. And as I sort of like fire it up here as well, like it's you fire it up in a in a in a in a browser and it's great. Like it looks like it looks like an app and it plays like exactly like you would expect it doesn't it doesn't feel like a lesser experience on iOS it feels just like like any other app which i was i was i was curious about but i feel like we're just going to see more and more of this of like using a web browser for something other than like our traditional ways that we're using web browsers so i i'm happy that this is a thing it's still very very small it seems like microsoft is is being very trepidatious maybe i don't know if there's i don't know exactly why if it's if they're testing servers or if they're uh scaling up or what they're learning through this beta but they they don't seem in any rush to go and here's xcloud like here's the big thing it's been step by step by step and mm-hmm. i think that's been smart i think that's been a good way for them to roll this out because it it allows people to keep their expectations in check right mm-hmm. like they're not coming out and going like this is a big deal it's 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 inviting people one by one or ten thousands uh, at a time rather than millions at a time, and I think it's engendering like a good community around those who want to try it are trying it and they and they they seem to like it. I seem to like it. I'm right with you on that, and I think that trepidation actually comes from from a couple different lessons that they've had to learn at various points uh, in their career and in watching competitors. Stadia mm-hmm. being the easy thing to look at, right? Uh, Stadio, you know, went all out with their marketing, told everybody it was going to be God's gift to cloud gaming, and then it stumbled and fell and had nothing there. And so there's some lessons to be learned from Microsoft on that front. Big but time. I also think what they're trying to do is enter into more markets than they exist in now. Uh, India, Japan, mm-hmm. Korea, places that are mobile heavy, uh, because with that infrastructure there, those people are going to be getting the best experience, and that will pilot more programs other other places. I wonder if COVID has anything to do with the way they're rolling things out, because fewer people are traveling, fewer mm-hmm. people are on some of those mobile networks, and that might actually benefit them as they, they kind of fix and nitpick and clean these things up. But I really am excited for the browser-based PC elements of it as well because how many games are people locked out of because they don't have the best hardware, the best tech to play certain things? And if they can play via the cloud, that's another market to enter. Big time. Uh, and, yeah. And for money to be made. Go ahead. Yeah, I think I think like – you know that as because right now it's still very centered around people who are already Xbox gamers. Like you, you're not getting an invite to this unless you you are an Xbox uh, Game Pass Ultimate subscriber. But mm-hmm. what I think that this is going to do is like it, at least in my experience so far, Luke is like when 
<laughs> if you've ever been stuck with that update that's keeping you from actually playing a game, like xCloud is going to start to shine where you go like, I've had people like we, we play Halos on Saturday nights and mm-hmm. um, every now and then Halo will drop like a nice 50 gig patch. And it's like, wouldn't it be great? <clears throat> wouldn't it be great if you could just jump on xCloud and play along with it? Like that's sort of, the, the, the the sales pitch around Stadia starts to become clearer and clearer as you start to hit some of those roadblocks. But then you can just like jump from one like like a console experience. You can jump to, to the cloud experience and just kind of like you have that as a backup as almost like an, an additional avenue to experience Xbox right now. Before where I think you're going, which is which is true, which is world domination, right? <laughs> yeah. We've got like we're kind of taking a bit of a stepping stone approach, it seems here. But uh, to me, like it seems, it seems like that's that's going to become more and more clear. And um, but at the same time, like we have these super fast consoles now, and the mm-hmm. and X Cloud is still based on on a one S kind of infra- infrastructure. And I would say that's the only kind of downside that I can see so far is that. I like my my speedy SSD now, you know. Mm, like I like sure. how fast games load, and when I fire up a game on on XCloud, I'm I'm reminded of those minute long loading times or firing up a game. Like that, that's that's the one thing. But it's speedy and and accessible in every other way. And I have no doubt that this is um, this is the future. I had no doubt with Stadia. Like I had up Stadia pre ordered. Back oh, when, no. when did that you thing really? was new. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I canceled it because I kind of got <laughs> I kind of got a sense that maybe it wasn't all that great. But they they hyped me up, man. I I was excited by the the notion of going from one screen to the next screen to the next screen, and that's really what we're getting with Xbox here, which is like mm-hmm. with the with cloud saves are so easy and it's it's not even close on any other platform, right? Like I, right. I, I continue to struggle with my Switch going like. Is this the right cloud save? Is this the right version? Like, I just don't even think about that kind of stuff. So Certainly. it's, yeah, I just, I, I now have Xbox, like, surrounding me. And people often ask, like, why am I, why am I, why do I prefer Xbox? This is another one of the reasons. It's an emerging reason. Because it's, like, it's just so easy. Like, I almost right. do it by accident. I almost play Xbox by accident because it's just everywhere right now. Well, it's funny. So it is everywhere. And it used to be, because uh, you and I were there at the dawn of Game Pass Ultimate when they announced mm-hmm. Game Pass Ultimate. And they, they, we were here in the room when I believe it was Sarah Bond talked about that uh, at E3 2019. And they kept talking around that time about reaching 2 billion gamers. And it seemed yep. absurd. In the press release for this particular topic, uh, at the very bottom it says, uh, this is an exciting step on our journey to bring gaming to 3 billion gamers around the world so they're already getting more ambitious uh not to mention the idea that you said xbox is all around you we are none too far away from where it it is going to be completely viable for customers who are interested to purchase a playstation 5 or a competing system switch 2 pro whatever you want to have super switch uh and then just have game pass ultimate and stream it to your devices and have a, a near comparable experience we're none too far away from that maybe two years uh, or so, and and I'm thinking about what you're saying about the Xbox One servers um, powering xCloud. I would imagine that had COVID not been a thing and production not been an issue, you know, getting yeah. physical uh, chipsets ready to go, we would be seeing these server racks be swapped out for Series S or X devices um, uh, sooner rather than later. But uh, I think the future is bright for cloud gaming, and this isn't Xbox yeah. specific, but for cloud gaming. But really and truly, when you have Stadia kind of flopping, Luna's on the periphery. We're not quite sure what Amazon's doing there. You have to think Sony is investigating, uh, though, you know, at the moment, news reports aren't suggestively supportive of that. Uh, I would think that Xbox is in a very good space to continue marketing uh, themselves to third-party investors and to bringing in studios because their their reach is growing tenfold in a space that's not nearly as competitive uh, as the console-specific hardware space. Yeah, I'm trying to remember a time, you know, for for Microsoft specifically when they made a bet like this and they they won so hard. Like this is basically the whole, and this is not a new comparison, Xbox Live. But- that's the only well, one. I guess so. Well, and, they, and but everybody caught up. Like they just like in a way that that destroys really all other competition in a way that like Netflix did to Blockbuster, right? Where mm-hmm. like Blockbuster yeah. made the bet, or I'm sorry, uh, Netflix made the bet on you. You want your movies streamed, right? They want that. That's the way people are going to consume. And Blockbuster doubled down on on their business model. They, I think, there was a, an opportunity for them to buy Netflix or at least be part of it, and they chose mm-hmm. not to. They're like, no, people want to. They want to rent their movies. And I'm curious to see how this plays out because it seems like this is as pivotal a moment where 
Sony seems to be doubling down on, and even Nintendo as well, they seem to be doubling down on on their strategy. And this is the early days. This is I'm, I'm looking at the app right now. Like, it says beta. We're in the very, very early stages, and I'm trying to, like, imagine what the future looks like. Is it is it as... As, as big a swing as we saw with Netflix, where you, you your Friday nights were spent at Blockbuster. They used to be spent at Blockbuster. You'd walk up and down the aisles. I have a lot of nostalgic memories, um, you know, with, with Blockbuster. And now it's like it feels like ancient history. And yeah. is this X Cloud thing going to be as transformative as that? Like um, in a way that 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 really cripples either Sony or Nintendo. I have a hard time believing that, and I'm not sure if if that's really the intention. But I kind of. I, I I do believe that the, that X, that cloud gaming is the future, and it's just a matter of yeah, how like I said, how transformative is this going to be? Where the way we used to play games is it so foreign to us? Does it almost like not make sense? Well, we'll be telling old stories to our children and our grandchildren that we used to we used to play on consoles. Like, is that is that right. within our lifetime? Is kind of the question that I ask. I think it is, and I would cite kind of another one of our news stories that is very much related to this, and that's Game Pass subs. Yeah, uh, We just found out in this past week that there are now 23 million Game Pass subscribers. Uh, there's no delineation between what Game Pass Ultimate is, which is, includes the cloud gaming uh, aspect, but mm-hmm. 23 million. Uh, and that puts them on track to clear 30 million by the end of 2021, which is bonkers when yeah. you think of how old the service is. Uh, when you think of how old Game Pass Ultimate is, I mean that was 2019 when Ultimate came out, uh, and it puts them into the you know 50 million. If, if you were to project, right? If you were to project and it doesn't slow down, that they get to 50 million subscribers by early 2023 uh, at the latest, based on those projections. Now that's projections and things constantly change but they're doing this with at with having while having i should say uh what i would argue is the weakest slate of first party ip at the moment Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. like they just do not have a god of war competitor a a ghost of Tsushima competitor uh in that quality realm uh outside of maybe sea of thieves but i think that's apples and oranges when you look at sea of thieves is, is numbers and penetration but the people that play Sea of Thieves uh, very rarely are the ones that also play God of War. You know what I mean? Like, there's just mm-hmm. a very different audience for that um, space. And if they're adding a million new subscribers a month and they can keep that, uh, I would have to think that these Outrider deals uh, continue until that first-party slate of IP uh, with all those acquisitions really gets going. Yeah, I think like I kind of hope that they merge together. You know, like I've I've heard this sort of um, this projection too, where this the the the, the current strategy is filling the gap until the first party slate kind of comes in. To be honest with you, Luke, like I I kind of hope that both continue. Like yes. once the that the first party kind of stuff com- comes in, and you still have like these same sort of deals that are happening with MLB the Show and Outriders mm-hmm. and everything else like that's been you know I'm sure spoken to spoken about at, at nauseum. Uh, I kind of hope that it's both. Right, because yeah. there's it's sort of it's that's basically what PlayStation does. They they also have a couple of uh, merging paths with their strategy as well, which is strong first party lineups. But then they also have um, some sort of exclusive deals or timed exclusive or whatever it is. Yeah. Like they they don't rely on one or the other, and that's mm-hmm. why you've seen PS4 and I think currently PS5 kind of carrying over with such huge success. I think once you start to see these whatever it is twenty three studios. Um, or I don't even know. Is it thirty plus? I can't even remember I think anymore. It's Twenty three right now. Yeah. Um, I think once those come together, and you still have you know Microsoft making those deals with the third parties coming in with day and date games, I, I expect there to be like a, a, a monthly cadence. Honestly, like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm kind of expecting them uh, to have some sort of announcement within the next couple of days. I have no inside knowledge, by the way, but just the way my brain works, I'm like I can't wait for them to come out and say. You know, in in May, here's your big game. And then in June, there's going to be a big game as well. And then we can start to see, hopefully we get, I don't know how much uh, rumor mongering we want to do, but I just saw a little thing that said Forza 5 is based in Mexico and could be coming out this fall. It's like, mm-hmm. this could be really big. And you're right. This is just, they're, they've sold us on the service and the games arguably haven't even come yet compared to what we are expecting in the future. I, you're absolutely right. And I'm thinking about those exclusive deals that Sony makes. They, I mean, for God's sake, if you are into Call of Duty, you should be playing on PlayStation because you level up faster, right? Like, there's just the, and with crossplay, it's easier to choose an ecosystem that suits your personal interests. Right. Uh, that said, 
I mean, Outriders exploded, despite being uh, what I argue is a very fun and yet mediocre game at the same time. How uh, dare you? I love Outriders. But so do I. <laughs> all of those criticisms I, I, that I hear about it are totally valid. It's just totally valid. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. all right. Um, and then I'm, I'm hearing, uh, or rather I'm hearing, I listened to an interview with the Dirt 5 devs none too long ago in which they cited Game Pass as a huge reason for that game's ongoing content drops and success because mm, Game mm-hmm. Pass is serving that audience even better. Um, and none of this is happening at the expense of sales for a game. So I would imagine you do see a steady steady rhythm of third-party games entering in. Uh, you know, if you want to go the rumor mill mount, uh route uh they've got they're very cozy with ea right now in a surprising yeah. way i mean does mass effect legendary edition get a window on can game you Pass imagine or? luke oh my god i never even thought of that oh well, i love mass effect and every mass effect game is available in game pass ultimate right now <laughs> and uh ea has gotten a huge drop of uh, fps boosted games uh, mm-hmm. recently mass effect not included in that list at the moment and i'm not sure if they're uh, if they have the boost from the from the first few waves, but what what a, a, an idea the idea that Legendary Edition could be into Game Pass uh, as part of the subscriber count or, or the old games get a boost as well like yeah that would only benefit Mass Effect which is uh, I think it's fair to say even with Legendary Edition coming out I mean that's a tarnished reputation given Bioware's uh, frustrations with Anthem and Dramas yeah. release uh, they need to finance Dragon Age uh, I could see a world where Legendary Edition does come to Game Pass because it's time for that next big game uh, right around that, you know, in that May window. Is it May? May is when. Yeah. Legend- yeah. Yeah. I have the time. Helmet time doesn't even mean game. anything right now, man. Are you kidding me? We're still <laughs> exactly. locked up in our cages for God's sakes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, like that would be that. Would, and that's perfect timing. That would actually be incredible. And uh, oh, I just love I love Mass Effect. I would love for that to be um, it, it's got its heritage in or on xbox a lot of people forget because it's sort of proliferated proliferated since then uh but it was an exclusive on 360 the original was you can only get that Mm -hmm. on 360 and i would love for that to kind of like return home like when i there's a reason why i love bioware and and xbox like i've I've played dragon age i played the mass effect games like they've all been on my xbox for that to come back to um to game pass i think it would be massive huh (laughs) yeah yeah yep you did it yeah you got that pun uh, for listeners of XCP exclusively, if you, if you don't listen to Cast Co-op or anything, uh, Mass Effect is a gaming gap for me. And, and Sean, I'll tell mm. you, I picked up one, two, and three at various points in my career and played maybe an hour of each at the most. Yep. Never really cared for them. I'm very excited for Legendary Edition with updated controls. We have this really great opportunity uh, in 2020 and 2021 to catch up on back catalog AAA games that we may yep. not have touched before. Uh, as games get delayed and moved around, I have actually, you know, on, on some level, really enjoyed getting to catch up on games. I think I'm going to go back into Horizon Zero Dawn very soon. Nice, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe Red Dead Two because I didn't entertain the idea of brushing a horse mm. when it first came out. Yeah, um, no, I don't. I don't know if that's going to come back. Yeah, I, don't, I can't imagine I would. I'm but shocked. That, I'm shocked that Mass Effect hasn't landed for you because Luke loves lore. Like you, there's lore. a ton of lore for you to dive into here, my friend. When it first came out. I was not into that. I was into Gears of War very heavy because mm-hmm. uh, Luke loved Gears of War. Um, <laughs> that was a very terrible way to – I tried to make it rhyme. It yep. <laughs> Luke lo- um, you, you almost said Luke loves war, and I don't think that's what you would have meant. Yeah, yeah, I do not actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> nonetheless, I it just missed it. I just missed it. There are some games we just miss when they yeah, first come that's out. that's true. And, and so, you know, here I am – surplus of money buying this stupid helmet uh having never really played the game stop did. did you really i did i did yeah <laughs> yeah if i don't like the legendary edition i will send you the helmet how's that <laughs> no you don't have I'll, I'll, it'll cost I'll, a I'll fortune do... over the border are you kidding me oh you're right that's right yeah shipping <laughs> oh gosh um nonetheless uh i'm excited by the idea of growing game pass i'm excited by the potential of different games to enter into it uh i'm just really curious to see how xcloud serves to to support Game Pass. I'm curious to see how third parties serve to support Game Pass because without that first party IP dropping in, the story is constantly Game Pass, Game Pass, Game Pass, not game A, game B, game C. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Yep. So. Yeah, I wonder like just how how do they sort of penetrate that mobile only market? Like this it's such a great none of us will argue that the Game Pass is a huge value if you've got 
access to all of the things. Like you can, you can play on your PC, you can play on your on your console, you can you can stream on your phone, you can stream on your PC as well. But for those who like only have the phone, and I, I don't even know if like it's worth getting into because I don't want to see them getting into more tiers. Like I don't mm-hmm. want to. I don't. I feel like some people have asked for should they have a five dollar Game Pass option for if you're just playing on your phone. Like I don't know that I want to see that, but I also don't know if if mobile customers mobile users are into the $15 a month subscription model either like I I'm not sure how that part is going to play out and I think them doing this additive rather than replace model is smart for them to do but I just there has to be a turn that they're they're eventually going to have to make where they they go outside of the like quote-unquote hardcore gamer audience and they get into the more the casual the mobile only audience and I'm curious what that that move is going to be it it can't just be what they're currently doing i feel like there's something different coming in order for them to to close that gap or jump over the chasm okay so this perhaps relates and talk me off the cliff or or talk me down or away from this topic if that's not correct but we it was just announced on the 21st of april that uh microsoft's finally making good on that free games are actually free now they've removed Mm. the paywall of an xbox live gold subscription so you can play your free-to-play games. That, of course, makes the uh, Xbox Series S much more uh, appealing you know, for its price point. Now you can get into Fortnite, Destiny, uh, Warzone, and a few other of the, the free-to-play games. If, if Xbox Live is no longer required and we exit the beta phase of Game Pass Ultimate or whatnot, uh, there's a potential where people can just log into Xbox Live on their phones and exist in that ecosystem for quote-unquote free because as we know, uh, and, and my Fortnite wallet would tell you, free to play is free to start, uh, like Nintendo says. And then you're yeah. spending buku money. I see a world where Xbox Live is just free for mobile users after we exit this 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 X Cloud beta, as it were. Yeah. Uh, and you just log in from where any anyone anywhere. And then if you want the benefits of Game Pass, they have a way to market it to you. Yes. And you're able to play things via Xbox Live if you're interested. That's the move. That's absolutely you're right. That is absolutely the move, um, and it doesn't involve like a five dollar price point, which I'm I'm just it makes my skin crawl hearing people talk about that. Um, mm. That totally that totally makes sense. I I do see a version of that where because like the number of like good quality free to start games is growing every single it seems like every single week, right? Yeah, but, it used to be so trash filled, mm-hmm. and now. Th- I mean, I, I'm you know I, I work with kids and and I'd walk by those kids are playing Fortnite on their mobiles and they're good and it's obscenely yeah. good. It's it's that's just how they do it. Well, and that's the, I mean Fortnite is an interesting one because you can already play it on your phone, right? So it's got to be mm-hmm. like it's got to be beyond that uh, to be able to play like additional games that you can't really already get on your phone. Like, and even like Call of Duty has a has a mobile game already. There's there's versions of what I think some of the bigger games are. Um, I think Destiny is like free to start as well, which is mm-hmm. real, that might be where the where the scales begin to tip a little bit because like mm-hmm. and it's an interesting point that you brought up because when I was thinking about this whole free to play business being you know you can actually play for free, I thought that was the strongest selling point for the Series S rather than thinking about going to phones. But I think you're right that there's there's a bridge to gap there. Um, yeah, man, that's that's really interesting. How how do they get in front of all these how do we reach these keys how do we get them (laughs) playing xbox on their phones because they already have so many options already that's kind of what i mean by they need something bigger than just what they've been doing because there's a there is a mobile market and there are good quality games that people can play with touch controls on their phones and that's people are already comfortable there so they actually are entering a bit more of a competitive space and i think people have maybe commented on because there's there's currently huge huge games some of the biggest games in the world are already played in mobile it's not i don't think it's as blue ocean as maybe it's been described in the past i think that's a good point and i would think that there are a couple ways you get people into that market first by offering uh exclusive like skins or whatnot like you know if you played if you played uh fortnite with master chief on your xbox series s or x you got the the black matte version of Mm. of that skin maybe they have if you log into xbox live uh, to play Fortnite from your mobile, you get this or that. But uh, they've got so many games coming out. I mean, we're talking about, like, The Ascent, Everwild, Crossfire X, Echo Generation, uh, Gunk, Exomecha. Maybe yeah. they release a couple of those for free uh, onto mobile Xbox Live at various points or for a month or two months um, in the future. I don't mean in this year, but, like, in the future, maybe that's a strategy to get people to log into Xbox Live from their mobile device 
and yeah. receive some benefit. I mean, Second Extinction is a game that will benefit from a number of players once it's ready to full launch. Maybe making that game free on Xbox Live via mobile is a way to go. And, and I'm spitballing here. Maybe there's not a market for that. But if you have Fortnite on your phone, you got to give them a reason to log in to Xbox Live from that phone. We say I, Xbox yeah. Live, Sean. We're, we're, we're casuals. We're, we, I, we won't mean change. Xbox <laughs> Network. <laughs> we won't change. We're, we're old. We, we're set in our ways, man. Um, I, I'm thinking about something, you know, if we ran Xbox. How do mm-hmm. how does how does Microsoft have some sort of deal? I can't imagine this would ever happen with Apple, but like maybe with a Samsung or something where it's like you get a free month of Game Pass with your new phone. Right? Like how do they get that just get you started basically? How do you how do you get people um experiencing it and change their behavior from what they, they where they're going to their app store to going to um to XCloud on their phone? Mm-hmm. I, I feel like something like that where it's on mass, it's available, it's baked in or or you know, packaged in with with the device that they're playing on. How do they get how do they get to that level? Is is kind of what I mean, I guess. Oh, easy peasy. They're already doing that kind of thing with TVs, or rather, they have the the d- deals built in. But imagine you buy a phone from Verizon. That's mm-hmm. the, that's the way you do it. You know, you buy a phone from Verizon, you get three months of Game Pass. Yeah, Th- that's yeah, the or way to or do like it. unlimited data or something like that. I don't know if that's like or just for X Cloud, which you know allows you to play it on the go. I think that was mm-hmm. a deal. That was that was something. I don't know if it was T Mobile or somebody had that with Pokemon Go when that was a huge thing, and and they were like, well. You get unlimited data when you're playing Pokemon Go. That seemed to be a big thing. So right. it's got to be a little bit more like integral and integrated with the um, with the mobile experience. And I think that they're that maybe that's just what they're waiting for. Like that's what they're ramping up to. They're in a beta stage. It's not right for them to do it right now. But mm-hmm. there's big moves I think they can make in, in order to get to that. You know, the, the scale up to three billion. <laughs> it doesn't just happen by like trying harder or yeah. wanting it more. It, there's there's big moves I think that we're gonna we can still see if they if seven point whatever billion for Bethesda. Um, we thought if the, we thought that was big, I, I still think there's there's bigger things to come in order to to scale up to half the world. You know, I'll tell you who I feel bad for is their contract writers. <laughs> yeah, as they yeah. enter into all these new markets, these multiple exclusivity deals and windows. Uh, that's got to be a, a nightmare of, of managing uh, where they, they're showing up and what the deal says they can and can't do, what games can go where. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's got to be that's got to be a nightmare. Well, it's even you nightmare. just said the word Windows. That makes me think about like you know the, the further expansion. We've been talking mobile, but what about the PC experience as well? Like, how do they bake it in to the PC experience and getting people who are on their their PCs just like give them that free month or whatever it is to get them started and cloud gaming on their on their PC, which I think is. A pretty big deal so far. Yeah, I think that's a huge deal in the future. Right now, I think Game Pass Ultimate for PC or Game Pass for PC is this hidden gem that very few people outside of Garrett Bland know about, and because <laughs> it's all strategy games and these brilliant gems of experiences that I don't think many people realize are available on yeah. Game Pass for PC uh, because people associate Xbox with console and right. soon to be mobile. But you're right, there is a, a hidden realm there, and if people can. With an underpowered PC, have high-powered experiences. Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty golden. Yeah, and as there, like, I have a pretty capable PC right now, but there will be there will come a time where I'm like, I probably should buy a new GPU if they ever become available, and I could be swayed the other way. Like, I've been down this road with PC gaming in the past. You know, 1998, I think I spent 700 dollars on a three accelerator card, and I mm-hmm. went, well, I can't do that every couple of years, and that's where I went over to. I think Dreamcast was my first console, so I think that there's there's these moments in time in in PC gamers' lives where they they look at themselves in the mirror and go, Can I spend another? couple hundred dollars on a new graphics card or i've been hearing about this other option that like i don't have to do that i think that becomes more and more compelling every time a new graphics card comes out or every time a a gamer is faced with an expensive upgrade do we want do do we need link or la to really have braces or do i want to upgrade this pc that's the battle that you're there's no braces no they'll no they just kind of have to they'll they'll sort it out they'll just figure it out manually yeah that's right it's evolutionary trait go for it Mm-hmm. Uh, very, very not quietly, but in the smaller topic, I suppose, is that FPS boost continues to be a selling point, uh, or rather, I should say, a good vibes media talking point. As yeah. EA has been, uh, or it, it was announced rather, that 13 EA games uh, are now going to be supporting 120 frames per second if you have the TV to support it. Uh, games from from various Battlefield experiences to Plants vs Zombies, of course, my personal favorites, Titanfall and Titanfall 2. Are in there. I know you love Titanfall as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Battlefront 2, which is a fantastic game now. 
uh, are all getting that FPS boost. I feel like FPS boost is the blast processing of this generation until <laughs> I experienced it. And now I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. All right. Pretty good. Decent. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just a better way to play, a more modern way to play games that you love. And it keeps them playing in a way that you remember them. Yeah, I think this is, like, my, my take on this is that it, this is the way it always kind of should have been. You know, and now we're finally there. When you when you, um, when you play a game, an old game on new hardware, it should run better in in parti- in, in various ways. And I think this is just this is huge. I, I think it's something that is undersold and under talked about and underappreciated. But I I think maybe one of the things maybe we just didn't have it for like a game like Titanfall two. I saw a lot of people going back to that, and also it was on it was on sale very recently. So of course it's in Game Pass, but it was on I think it was like three dollars or something. So mm-hmm. a lot of attention going to going to Titanfall. But this is just the way it should be, Luke. When I buy a, a big expensive you know Xbox and it's got all the teraflops, I should be able to play old games and they work. They work better, and it just mm-hmm. becomes a, an additional, like another notch in the belt, another another um, another win for for Xbox, another reason to play on Xbox versus other other platforms. It's I think these games are great, and they should play at 120 frames. And this is another thing that I think a lot of people kind of turn their nose up and go like, "Who needs 120 frames? That's actually ridiculous." And then they play and they go, it's "Exactly what you did." And it's pretty nice. I kind of yeah. like this. Fully agree, and uh, I do hope they add into. We had I had a listener question that I cannot find for the moment, but somebody asked like, what feature I want to come next. I want to toggle all or all, uh, all on or all off for FPS boost. Currently, you have to go in per game to adjust it under compatibility options. But I'd like to be able to toggle all on or all off. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, just a little thing like that would be cool. But uh, yeah, it's almost like these games are getting smart delivered. <laughs> Again, another another feature people kind of laughed at and like, why do you need this? And it's these when you, when you just take them all together, the FPS boost, the smart delivery, all the things like they mm-hmm. just it's such a good experience. But none of these bullet points are anything that anybody goes, I play Xbox because of FPS boost. Like, no, I don't know right. that anybody's really doing that, but you right. add them all up. And yeah, it, it's it's kind of a no brainer. At least it is to me. And I'm sure it is to you as well. Yeah. The experience is objectively better on on nearly every game that comes out they're only lacking that that major ip uh that gets the people going like a god of war or a ghost of tsushima or yeah. uh, zelda or whatnot and i genuinely i genuinely think those things are on their way um maybe not in the next year but in in the years to come i think uh i think obsidian is is the one to look at for for that next big thing as it were and of course people that love bethesda are in for treats uh over the next few years as well Sean, let's take a quick break and then get to listener mail. This is Steve Downs, the voice of Master Chief Sierra 117, with a shout out to the Xbox Expansion Pass. Thanks for listening to XEP. Master Chief, out. Okay, listener mail here. We've got plenty of things to talk about. Again, I want to apologize to those of you who wrote in last week. I kept some of those questions. I apologize for not getting to the show there, but let's tackle some of these questions this week. Sean, this first one comes from Elemento PO. He says, hey, Xbox has been gaining so much momentum with media and gamers alike. You could say Microsoft is winning a lot more mindshare this gen than last gen with its services, while Sony continues to sell hardware this gen with PlayStation 5. The question, what's more significant, mindshare or sales? You go first, bud. I mean, it's, it's, it's different because... I don't know if it, if either. Uh, I think engagement is really what at least Xbox is after right now, and so they can have fewer uh, consoles sold or fewer even users. But if people are you know buying more games per user, like there's or playing more hours or spending more time in the ecosystem, like that's really the metric. But it is mm-hmm. it is it does seem like mindshare begets sales, right? Like mm-hmm. it, it's sort of one has to come before the other. And that's sort of what has happened in the past. We've seen that where the, the, the narrative really drives what happens in the future. And I think that's why people are so excited about Xbox right now because of where the mindshare is, where the conversation is, and how positive it is versus we've – like it was just a short 10 years ago almost uh, with you know TV, TV, sports, and everything and, and um, 
digital rights and everything that Don Matrick was trying to introduce. So it's a long time since then. And, and people took that narrative and they ran with it. And it was the same thing with the Wii U. So I don't think that Mindshare is not important compared to engagement and sales, but um, actually quite the opposite. But it's it's not a guarantee still. Like you still have to convince people to do the thing that you're trying to get them to do. It's a behavioral change to stop buying this thing and buying our thing or the Xbox thing. So right. it's it's complicated a little bit. I don't know that one is more or the uh, more important than the other, uh, more or more significant uh, than the other. But um, it's a very exciting time if you're an Xbox fan because you're starting to see something that. I don't know, Luke, like we haven't really seen before, which is just en masse positivity for Xbox. It's It's been years and years, and we've been podcasting about Xbox for a long time. It's been years and years of trying to convince other people, like, it's good. Like, I tell you, like, see these. I, I swear it's fun. And, and mm-hmm. people kind of looking uh, with doubt at you going, like, yeah, I'm sure. good over here at Nintendo. I'm good over here with PlayStation. And now you're not having to defend. You're not having to persuade. Like, the brand and the, the, the ecosystem is kind of doing that on its own. And it's mm-hmm. more of a, a conjoined conversation and where you're going, like, see? You know what I mean? Like, I told you it was kind of good. And people are like, yeah, I was going to tell you the same thing. You're giving me flashbacks to how many times with with any number of games from that that mid to late Xbox One generation where I was like, no, it's good now. You know, Master Chief mm-hmm. Collection is good now. State of K2 is good now. Sea of Thieves is finally good. You know, like, it's it's funny. And when I think about this mindshare versus sale, of course it's going to be case by case uh, in, in, in the bigger picture. However, at the moment, because of the financial backing and investment that Microsoft's put in, I can argue that it's mindshare. Right, they don't need the money from sales right now, and certainly knows. Uh, while PlayStation Five is outselling, Microsoft is sold out. You know what I mean? It's about mm. they don't have the units to sell. Uh, I think in a in a world where they had plenty of chipsets, PlayStation would still be selling. You don't get 110 PlayStation Four fours sold, 110 million PlayStation Fours sold, and not sell a good old chunk of PlayStation Fives and convert that user base. Yeah. However. Uh, Microsoft's dealing in subscriptions, in services, and uh, in selling point. And that mind share, that general wave of positivity just continues to, to flourish. And the, the big faux pas they made in the last year was that, you know, raise the price of Xbox Live Gold. Uh, and that was nullified within 24 hours. Yeah. Moreover, uh, they had, I think, one or two inside Xboxes with some false expectations, and they've worked very hard to set expectations. Uh, as it were, they seem to be very proactive and reactive in, in a fast sense, whereas their competitors are uh, a bit slower to do so. And as a result, that mind share is genuinely positive all the way around uh, for Xbox. It's hard to argue they're doing things poorly, uh, even if you're a PlayStation or a Nintendo primary gamer. And uh, like I said earlier, I see a world where people are buying playstations or buying a switch and then they have a, a, a game pass subscription for a device i yeah. see that happening well um, with all the nintendo switches appearing in everybody's shells and all these videos like i feel like that's gonna be there's there's, there's got to be a big announcement coming on that front and i know that th- that's not a new thought that's not unique to me but mm-hmm. i i'm hopeful for that because i have a switch and i think it'd be a perfect fit it, it totally rounds out the catalog on Switch. And it, it already, you were talking about all the different ways that people can play on their phones with the, the Razer uh, and the, all the different contraptions. Nintendo already figured this out, how it's supposed mm-hmm. to feel. It's, and it's the way that the Switch feels in your hand, especially if you mm-hmm. have a Switch Lite. Like, that thing is, it's damn near perfect. It, it, feels, it feels like a Vita. I think the Vita was an excellent handheld as well. Um, I think that would, be, that would be excellent. Love the Vita. Oh, you're making me happy. All right. Well, well, it's funny you're, you bring up the Switch because Todd Oxter wrote in with that. Uh, and he says, with rumors of Game Pass going through xCloud to Switch, is it time that xCloud has its own tier? GPU is the only way to stream $15 a month. A Game Pass Ultimate is the only way to stream uh, $15 a month with a barrier. Uh, he's wondering if they should perhaps adjust it in the idea of, of Game Pass going to Switch. Uh, should that happen? And for listeners that don't know what Sean was referencing... In quite a few Xbox executive presentations of late, Switches have been in the background. Um, if there's an Xbox or a Game Pass Ultimate thing, and you've touched on this already, but mm-hmm. to answer Todd's question specifically, should there be a small tier for things like the Switch? I don't know. I, I, it's funny because I, I didn't see that Todd had asked this question, but I was channeling Todd when I was speaking about this a little bit earlier because I've heard him talk about this on his show, Secret Friends Unite. No, I don't want this at all. Um, but I'm not a I'm not a marketing guru or genius or anything like that. I don't I don't know if, what is necessary, but I do. I my in my mind, simple is better. 
when mm-hmm. you've got like this for that people over there and this for that over there, like I just I don't think that that's the direction that they need to go. And I continue to bring up the comparison with Netflix, which is you pay a subscription fee and you can watch it on whatever device it happens, whatever device you're on. If you happen yeah. to have like a an amazing home theater system, like you don't pay a different price for like and if you have a great system at home. Um, although maybe I'm there's a there's a thorn in my theory here. Is there a different price for 4K content, Luca? I'm not no, sure. Maybe there not is. Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Uh, so maybe it's possible. But, you know, no, I don't. I don't want that. But yeah, I, there there is something he kind of talks about. Should uh, gold replace it, or it should be replaced by gold? Um, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with gold. I think what you touched on before is actually the best bet. Is um, maybe if it, yeah, if it's going to be on 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 Switch that that's just where you get to play some of your free to play games like that would be how you play Call of Duty on your mm-hmm. on your Nintendo Switch because there is no yeah. mobile version there right, right. um that would be re- or that's how you play Destiny on Switch that that's very very compelling i would say and it's just a matter of how do you get in front of the Nintendo audience that will be the interesting piece how do you get them on board it is it a is it like first 3 months for for a dollar again i i feel like that seemed to work on on Xbox, it'll be interesting to see what they do to convince Nintendo gamers to buy into an Xbox ecosystem. Agree. Agree. I'll be curious to see if uh, the system's powerful enough to, to handle that. That'll be a testament to xCloud technology as much as anything if they're able to get it right. running and streaming. That's kind well. of what I would be assuming anyways. Yeah, it's just all yeah. streaming. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, Nicholas Downey writes in. He says, with Xbox positive news and updates coming nearly every week, uh, what's a feature or piece of news that you hope will end up will come soon? Uh, for example, a console feature or a new backward compatibility uh, game on its way. I'll answer this one first. I think I touched on it. I want a select all toggle for FPS boost or things like that. Um, we've already seen they've done a good job at noting if a game is on suspend uh, or auto HDR or whatnot. And those kind of notifications to let you know if there is uh, something your system's doing in the background among these things. I would like mm-hmm. more clear ways for that. I do want the return of the back and pat program to start spitting out games once more. There are a lot of games that are locked back in the old days due to licensing or any other reason. I want those to be making their way forward. Um, and beyond that, I think as far as news coming out, uh, we need more third-party stuff hitting Game Pass day and date. Uh, yeah. Mass Effect Legendary we accidentally stumbled into, but that would be the one that, that would make sense. That would be huge. Um, there's two things for me. Number one is sort of more of a meta answer. The first one is... Um, if they can lock down how they deliver the news, like if like everything, we, there's a lot of great positivity around it. People are, are excited about Xbox, and they've basically been on like like blog posts, right? Like mm-hmm. these are these are announcements that, that they've been dropping, and everybody's excited, and, and which is great. But they still kind of stink at the digital experience. The like Nintendo does directs better. Uh, arguably, PlayStation does like their version of that better it seems like xbox is still kind of like stumbling on how to deliver like a a program right the the the, ind- the recent indies um, feature on twitch was was an interesting kind of kind of test it seemed that the hours long thing and then nintendo comes on a couple of weeks later with a nice concise delivery of that i would like them to be better about that and then the other thing that i would like them to do and, and announce and and sort of put their head down on PlayStation or put their foot on PlayStation's head is more options for uh, expansion storage. Because PlayStation continues to struggle with this. There's really not an option. Um, you can have games stored on external storage, but you can't play them. It's a whole it's a whole mess. They're still waiting on that internal M.2 NVMe um, internal storage expansion. No real word there. Give more options to people who don't want to spend three hundred dollars on a on an expansion card if there's a 500 gigabyte expansion card that um that makes more sense price wise for more gamers i think that that would go a long way especially for any of us with a series s which doesn't really have a whole lot of space man Mm -hmm. absolutely so that's a great great choice there um i I, man i want those those memory cards you know the the expandable storage seagate ones mm-hmm. i want a halo themed one because it certainly looks like that chip master chief puts in it oh helmet. yes no? of course <laughs> i want that. that that's how you get me to spend 200 dollars uh of a terabyte of storage that's an mm-hmm. excessive price but i'd do it for that all right our last question sean is a fun one i have a feeling i know your answer but i'm going to answer first on this one this one comes from our buddy dan O. he says you've just been given a lifetime beverage sponsorship of your choosing it only covers drinks no matter if they sell food 
Who is your sponsor? Also, what <laughs> old school uh, accessory do you wish you had when you were growing up? Uh, example, the rocking chair with speakers or a simple <laughs> <light up> controller. <laughs> Um, Dano, if anyone's going to sponsor XEP, uh, it would be Fairlife because Fairlife Chalky Milk is amazing. It doesn't have lactose, so I can drink it, and it's all protein for sure. Wow. Uh, and the the peripheral uh, or the, the, the accessory I want I, – I don't know if you can say it's an accessory, but it was so – it's so niche. Man, I wanted a virtual boy, and I still do. I still do want a Good virtual God. boy. Good it's stop. so bad, but I want one. Just oh now. man, I'm, my my stomach turned upside down just thinking about looking yeah, through the. Oh gosh, it would make you throw up, right? You think VR is mm-hmm. bad now? <laughs> yeah. Uh, for me, of course, yeah. This is this is predetermined. McDonald's would sponsor uh, the Xbox Drive. Uh, I would get an unlimited supply of. I, I've been doing decaf coffee. I don't know if you knew that, Luke. I've been doing decaf with the with the two Splenda. Um, <laughs> what is this? Yeah, there's. I haven't had like a caffeinated, like a real caffeinated drink in a in a long time. So Have give me the diet coffee, away? diet coke. Diet coke's mm-hmm. gone. Oh, wow. Well, diet coke. I still. I mean, like I said, like there's there's some caffeine in there. I don't do. Haven't had an energy drink in a long time. I haven't had a caffeinated <laughs> coffee. I get that little, like just that little little bit in, in the just diet, bit. Uh, just in the diet bit. soda. Yeah. That would be a no-brainer, absolutely. The accessory, uh, what I want, and I just, man, I can actually see them doing this, is I would love um, an elite version of um, a joystick. Um, Back in the day in PC gaming, I had a Microsoft Sidewinder. I would love to have them bring back the Sidewinder and have it, like, uh, give it the same treatment as the elite controllers. That would just be, I could see them, the reason I could see them doing that is because um, Flight Simulator is coming. So I can see them kind of doing that day and day, like play Flight Simulator on your on your Xbox Series X and play it with this Sidewinder uh, joystick. That would be unbelievable. I feel like if I've upset Todd Oxra before, that maybe he'll be appeased by that because I think he would like that too. That's a win right there. And listeners should know that when Sean and I used to, to work together on Xbox Drive, it was always McDonald's coffee. And when I reached out to him to come on to this episode, Sean, what would you send me? <laughs> Like I said, yes. Uh, <laughs> what where were you? you? Where were you? I don't know. You said, I can't remember what I did. I just really? woke up. What the? <laughs> oh my gosh! Okay, so Sean sent me a picture of him this. in the drive-through oh. at McDonald's. <laughs> I thought That's that so was funny. Yes, you're right. Yeah, I thought that was quite funny and appropriate, all things considered. Yeah. I've spent the weekend building a building a playground for my kids, so it's like that. I feel like I haven't escaped my backyard over the last forty eight hours. I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, Luke. You're good. It's all right. It was just a funny thing for me to be like, "Well, that's mm-hmm. that's oddly appropriate." I was at McDonald's. Yeah. All right, ladies and gents, thank you for listening to this portion of the Xbox Expansion Pass. Before I send you over to Ramiel's, Rami Ismael's interview, uh, I would ask you, of course, to check out all the socials that Sean is about to share. And, of course, if you are following uh, the Xbox Expansion Pass on YouTube.com slash Xbox Expansion Pass, maybe throw a like down onto the episode, writing, rating on iTunes, etc., etc. Sean, please let the people know where they can find your many, many projects. Thanks, man. Well, thanks for having me on. This was a lot of fun. It uh, it brings back old memories, my friend. Um, people can find me on Twitter at Sean Capri, Sean like Connery, Capri like the pants. Uh, we've alluded to the podcast, the Xbox Drive, which I record in a car. I get coffee at McDonald's. Um, it's about 45 minutes, so nice short take on Xbox news. And if you want something completely different, I host a show called We The Gamer Cast, where I have sweet hangs with strangers from the internet. And it's uh, we just talk about life and games. It's a, it's a nice free flow chat. And, um, yeah, definitely if you're looking for something different than Weed the Gamer cast is for you. But, Luke, thank you so much for having me on today, dude. It was a pleasure. And they can find you on Twitter at Sean Capri. I think I, yes. I, think I launched with Did that. But, yes, yeah, uh, we'll Did say it again. Say Sean Capri, Sean like Connery, Capri like the pants. All right. That's what, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I missed it myself because it is early for me as well. Uh, it is a pleasure to have had you on, Sean, a long time coming. Uh, and I hope that listeners enjoyed the reunion of sorts. Let's kick Big it over time. to the interview, guys. All righty, guys, it is my pleasure now to welcome Rami Ismail, game developer, <laughs> traveler, ambassador. You have a lot of titles to your name, my friend. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, that is, it's, it sounds like quite a list if you say it like that. 
It, it does indeed, my friend. And I will tell you this. It has been uh, something I've long time been hoping to do is, is sit down with you and talk about uh, the various roles that you have played in the gaming industry because I have seen you quite active on socials. I've seen you uh, in, in pulling up YouTube dev conferences there, and I've seen you advocate – uh, for different voices throughout the gaming industry, particularly in the last few years. Uh, man, you got a resume. When did you decide to get into video games? I mean, the question kind of has two answers, right? Like, I think the choice was made for me when I was pretty young. Uh, mm -hmm. I was, uh, I must have been six years old. We got our first computer at home, and it was one of those MS-DOS computers, and there was a, there was a programming language on it called QBasic. And with that came two tutorial files, one called Nibbles, which was just Snake, as we know it. Mm -hmm. And one was Gorillas, which was uh, like uh, Scorched. Remember the game with the tanks and you had to enter like an angle and a velocity and it would shoot sort of like a projectile? I that kind do of game. vaguely remember that, yeah. Right. There used to be a big thing because it was just basic math to make that game. Those two came with uh, QBasic and... I had a sibling, and we would play uh, Gorillas, the, the tank game, but with two gorillas all the time, and just be throwing bananas at, e at each other. And uh, the um, the thing about that is, you you had to open the code to play the game. And I didn't I didn't speak or read or understand any English back in the day, right? I was mm -hmm. I'm, I'm Dutch Egyptian, so I speak I speak Dutch and I spoke Arabic. Uh, but beyond that, I, I had no practice with English. So for me, all the letters on the screen were just random, right? It was just like words. And every now and then I would kind of recognize something, but that was it. But one of the things on there was um, the um, the menu text, like Microsoft Gorillas was what it was mm -hmm. called. And uh, I went, I deleted that, and I typed Rami Ismail. I typed my name there. And then when I ran the game again, instead of Gorillas, it said my name. And I was just fascinated that you could change letters and that would change something that feels as solid as a game, mm -hmm. right? Like this thing just changed. It was like being a magician. Um, and that fascination never left me. Um, so for the next uh, decade, 15 years of my life, I spent a lot of time modding. I, I modded like uh, tiny games. Back in the days, everything was saved in, in plain text. So everything from like Urban Assault to honestly all sorts of games uh and then level editors a lot of games came with level editors uh starcraft was a big one uh, i think jash jack rabbit like games like that uh that allowed you to take around with that i just did that for for 10 15 years and then i joined this small little indie studio from Bo boise idaho doing space sims uh well joined is a big word i i volunteered some uh some help every now and then and it gave me kind of this glimpse of, like, what it could be like to make games for money. Mm -hmm. And then I had, to choose a, I had to choose an education. And I just, I genuinely didn't believe there was such a thing as game design education, right? Like, that sounded ridiculous. Like, why would they teach you to make video games? Is that a job? <laughs> um, and part of that was just, I, you know, all the people that I saw making games, they're, all their names were, like, John or Chris or whatever. Like, my name is Rami. And my friends are named, like, uh, Ramon or, like, you know, uh, uh, Laurence or, like, na names you don't see in credits. Mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't really believe there was a job like that. I thought it was some sort of magical thing that happened in, in America, probably. Uh, and and that, was, that was it, right? But then I found this games education, and I decided to, to enroll. And um, I was there for two years, hated it. Uh, dropped out and started a game studio. That's that's. I think that is the conscious moment where I decided to be who I am now, like independent game developer. And where was this? I mean, we mentioned that you were Dutch Egyptian. Uh, right now, I believe you're in, you're in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, and but what language were you speaking if English was not native? And where was this taking place? So the, most of the story takes place in the Netherlands. I mean, there's obviously some hops to, to Egypt in there. Um, when um, when we were younger, uh, my parents uh, had to decide whether we were going to live in the Netherlands or Egypt. And, and the educational system and the opportunities in the Netherlands just exceeded those that were available in Egypt at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so most of my life, uh, my home base, my official home base was the Netherlands. My home address was the Netherlands. But we would spend quite some time in Egypt, and honestly, I think a lot of my games knowledge comes from Egypt, because in the Netherlands, 
<laughs> in the Netherlands, I have to buy my games. Mm-hmm. In Egypt, everything is pirated. Right, because ah. the the prices for games are obscene there. Like if you if you think a sixty dollar game is expensive, think of what it must feel like if a game is like a third, at least a third of your monthly salary. Um, that's what they look like. So if you buy a PlayStation in a in a store and it's not like a big official store in Egypt, mm-hmm. if you buy a PlayStation, it's a modded one. If you buy a game from a store and it's not one of the big international supermarket chains, the CD key on the back is just going to be zero 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 zero. Right, like everything was modern, including my first games console, which was um, I'd, I'd asked my dad to get a PlayStation. <laughs> he went to the black market and came home with a police station. Oh no! <laughs> which looks like a PlayStation, but instead of a CD reader, it had a cartridge slot because it was just it was just a NES with um, what what it said was 99 games preloaded, which is how the black market. Uh, sales guy convinced my dad that it was better than a PlayStation. Mm. Um, but instead of 99 games, it was, even that was a lie. It was technically 10 games, just repeated nine times. Uh, but they would be weird, like sprite hacks. So, like, game number four would be Super Mario Bros. And then uh-huh. game number 14 would be Super Luigi Bros. And just the sprite for player one and player two was, like, swapped or. There was a really broken one where in every level of Super Mario Bros. you had the controls as if you're underwater. Mm-hmm. So you could just swim through, like, the mushroom level. And so these weird hacks that were there, Super Swimmer Bros. or something, you know, like. Mm-hmm. Um, so well, yeah, did, mo- that, did that affect you at all? I mean, you liked messing around early on with, with gorillas. Did you ever uh, open up your police station? I did. I blew it up. <laughs> uh, by accident. It turns out messing with hardware is a lot more complicated than messing with software. And if you mess with software, the worst you might do is the game might crash or you might format your computer. But if you do it with hardware and you do something wrong, uh, sparks fly. And, uh, yeah, this uh, this police station, it did not survive. I still have the burnt out police station. Like, it's, it has pretty significant, like, marks on it. I still have it sitting in my cabinet as a... It's a reminder of the many devices I've sacrificed in my career. That is awesome. <laughs> that is absolutely awesome. So I inter- I interrupted you, but that was a great detour. So I I, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, you ended up uh, going leaving school because you it wasn't a dev school, but you weren't happy with uh, it, having a dev program. It was it was a game dev school. The, the problem is, and and this is something that's really hard about game design, right? If you want to teach game design. It's a bit, a lot of it is between the lines. It's not a skill where you read a book and now you're a game designer, right? Mm-hmm. Like game design comes with practice and experience and understanding and uh, honestly, life experience as well, right? Like the, the more you see, the more you've done, the more you've played, the more you've been through, the, the better you understand people, the better you understand games. Uh, because in the end, that's what they are. The games are our method of communication, right? We're speaking mm-hmm. to the player and sort of suggesting, oh, if you do this, We'll make if you play this, we'll make you feel good about yourself, or we'll make you feel sad, or we'll give you a challenge that will excite you or frustrate you, or you know that we're communicating. Right. Um, and you get better at that as you do more of it. So, so the problem with game design school is that they're stuck to law, right? They're stuck to the laws of how a school program should look, and it's this very rigid very systemic way of like grading people of telling people whether they did a good job whether they did a bad job you know a certain breadth of experiences you might need to have so it just wasn't really for me i'd been making games at that point for 15 years i'm not going to say i was good but i felt better at my job than i felt some of the teachers were Mm -hmm. right and that might it might sound arrogant but like that was the that was the feeling i got Mm-hmm. And uh, I got in a fight with school because because I was bored in that second year. I set up a project on my own, and this was the days where Xbox Live Arcade and Xbox uh, Xblig, Xbox Live Indie Games were like the big things, right? If you wanted to be an independent developer, that was like the dream. That was the big thing. That was the big leak. Was that was as big as you could get. Steam wasn't that big of a deal yet. iOS didn't really exist or didn't exist. I'm not actually sure which one it was. Uh, Android wasn't there yet. Like. Selling on computer meant that you needed to print discs, basically. Mm-hmm. And um, um, selling on console wasn't possible. Nintendo didn't do indie games. PlayStation didn't do indie games. The only thing you had was Xbox Live Arcade. So I set up my own project, and I collected 
about 15 to 20 of the best students of school, and I said, we're going to make a commercial Xbox Live Arcade game. Uh, and we started on that, and it actually went pretty well. We actually went, got through the first round of selections, which was really hard and not something that students did, right? This was for advanced games companies, and here we were making a, a big game for Xbox Live Arcade. Mm-hmm. And then uh, school killed it because everything that was made at school was owned by school as long as you were a student. Uh, and they didn't want the financial risk of a student going bankrupt or, like, getting into big money deals or whatever. Uh, plus, they needed the students for their own projects because they would outsource – companies would outsource projects to the school, and we would basically be working as, like, free labor, right, in exchange mm-hmm. for a grade. Um, so they killed the project because they needed those students, and they killed the project because it was a financial risk, and uh, that was it for me. I was done. So I quit, and there was one other guy who quit. He also worked on the same project. Uh, he worked with me on that project. I don't think he was too impressed or excited by it. He was a, a bit of an obnoxious, artsy, hipster kind of designer. Um, really thought that games were all about art and that money was a detriment to games. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I grew up in a family where my dad told me that I can be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or a disgrace to the family, right? Because in Egypt, <laughs> money – money is a thing you need to live. And I know in the Netherlands, that's not quite how it works with really good social welfare and stuff like that. But my attitude was always, if I do something I love, I need to figure out how to make my father proud. Right. Mm-hmm. And part of making my father proud is be able to pay for my own life, being able to get like a place to live and like potentially have a family, raise a family, whatever it was. Like I, I wanted to fit that mold. Um, so uh, this guy thought I was a suit, that I only cared about money. and um, But we were the only two dropping out. So we started a company together, and that was Flambeer. There you go, man. That is that is the, the funniest journey. And I teach – I'm an English teacher by nature, and I have seen many times kids or students struggle with feeling like they were beyond the system and the system holding them back. And uh, it's really cool to hear that you – kind of broke that mold i guess in in the right ways yeah it's it's and it's the thing with education and in games but in all education is that it is hard like the more you standardize it the harder it becomes because there's always going to be people that go a little slower on a certain subject or go a little faster on a certain subject or that have experience from their life that put them in different spots and i think a large part of being a teacher is trying to figure out how within that system you can make it possible for people to like flourish right Mm -hmm. um my dad is a teacher and i have i have the utmost respect for anybody in education whatsoever because it's it's hard it's really hard uh but if i look at my life you know when i said at six i started making games i think the person that made me who i am today besides my parents besides my friends was probably my elementary school teacher Mm -hmm. his name was uh, his name was meister robert we we call them master meister Mm -hmm. um meister robert and uh, Mr. Robert, he um, he realized really early on that I wasn't an annoying kid. Well, I was an annoying kid, but I was mostly a bored kid, mm-hmm. right? I was bored in school. And I was five or six at that. I must have been five. Um, so he started, for me, just for me, for a single for a single kid, he started a chess program and a computer program. And with the chess, the teacher that he got us, the guy wanted to teach us chess, but he also wanted to teach us uh, creative thinking. His name was Pete. And um, Pete then came up with the idea of letting us design our own chess games. So we would change where the pieces would be, right? The pawns would go on the back row or, like, what if uh, what if the rooks move like knights? Mm-hmm. Or what if uh, both bishops are on black? Or what if uh, you flip the order of the pieces? Or, you know, like... Uh, make your own rules chess and we will play lots of uh, chess variants that way and that i guess is my first entry to game design really because before that changing code is programming not Mm -hmm. design Uh, changing the rules of a game that's design and then the computer program obviously opened me up to spending way more time with computers Uh, that chess program is still going um that computer program is still going uh that's now what 25 years later 26 years later and uh, Mesa Robert retired recently, and I went back to the school 
to uh, to thank him for everything he'd done. And it was remarkable because he, as I walked in, he recognized me and he just said, like, Rami? I'm like, yeah. He said, wow, you've grown. I'm like, the last time you saw me, I was five. Like, what did you, <laughs> what did you expect? He's like, how did things work out for you? And I showed him some news articles of like awards I'd won and like things I'd been doing and the travels I'd been on. He just looked at me, he's like, seems it worked out, didn't it? I'm like, <laughs> I'm glad you think so because in the end, like making him happy with the the risk he took, right, setting all those programs up and the time he invested in it, I didn't know that that would mean so much to me, but it it really did. It really did. What a cool what a cool anecdote. That's really neat and, and a feel good story. And it's uh, it's nice to know that the the stuff that matters mattered. You know, right. Uh, yeah. So that that's really cool to hear and. You know, when you said you are showing him news articles, I mean, in preparing for this interview, I found any number of articles from, you know, the early days of working in mobile titles to having to deal with someone, someone cloning your game uh, to going to Devolver Digital and making a bad pitch. I mean, uh, <laughs> to make an RPG of, of serious damage. What a cool uh, bit of story. Tell me about once you got to Vlambeer, making Ridiculous Fishing on, on – uh, Flash, I believe, and right. that progression because it's just I don't know. It's, it's, tell, it's start ridiculous. With me there, yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, no. So so Flamber started as two dropouts, right? And um, at that point, we had this little prototype that we called Crates from Hell. It was um, it was a tiny little arcade game. And something was just very special about it. Like it was a it was a uh, um, a prototype by JW Jan Willem, my my co-founder. Um, and very early on, we had realized that there was something special there, and it wasn't quite there yet, and we needed more time to get it right, because what JW was good at was prototyping. This kid was prototyping one, two, three, four games a day, and most of them were bad. And then every now and then, one of them would be good. And this one wasn't just good. This one this one was something special. Like, to this day, I think that game might have been one of the, the best things uh, I've ever worked on. Um but we needed money to do that, so we decided that we would make um, we would make a small flash game. Back in the days, flash games were those sites you would play on those websites, you know, during school breaks or something. And the way that would work, that market worked, was you would make a flash game, and then these big sites that served all of these games would buy them from you, and then earn money with the ads on the website, right? Mm-hmm. And this was a huge market; millions and millions of dollars went around in that. So we. We negotiated with a few of them, and we ended up with $10,000, uh, which was enormous for us, right? Mm-hmm. And we used that to uh, – that game was Radical Fishing, which is a game about fishing with machine guns. So Radical Fishing uh, launched, and it did well. And then Super Crate Box uh, was what that prototype that I was talking about turned into. And Super Crate Box was, was like I said, still in- incredible. And it was nominated for a lot of awards, uh, Independent Games Festival Award. Like uh, pretty much everything that did awards for indie games back in the days, by Jacker, IGF, whatever, um, all of them had Super Great Box up in up in their lists. And uh, that meant we got to go to San Francisco, my first big international trip, first time across the ocean. Um, we met all of these incredible people and, and legends, uh, indie game heroes, stuff like that. And... Um, one of the people that we met, and we wouldn't know it at the time, was um, came to us with a very basic idea, uh, which was, what if we bought Sirius Sam, the uh, IP of Sirius Sam, and uh, we're working with the studio that develops it, uh, Crow Team, and we we want to do something a little a little strange, and we want to have some indie games to go with that, like spinoffs. Mm-hmm. And we liked Super Crate Box, so we were thinking of, like, working with you for that. And by this time, you know, we'd released some more games. We'd done a game for Adult Swim called Dinosaur Zookeeper. We'd done a freeware game called Gun Gods, which was uh, a shooter on Venus, first person shooter on Venus. Um, and we were like, okay, you know what? You're suits, right? You're, you just want us to reskin Super Crate Box and release it as Serious Sam. And we thought we're not going to work with these. We're not going to work with this guy. Like this guy's clearly a suit. Like why else would he come in like that? Like I own an IP, like, come on, get the, you know, get out of here. Um, 
so we came up with the best plan ever because we actually love serious sound. It's right up Lambert's alley, right? Fast action, arcade, explosions, everything. It's right up our alley. But we just we, we weren't feeling it. We we weren't feeling comfortable. So we said, okay, what if we pitch just the worst possible pitch? Just the the worst idea you could come up with. And um so we thought, okay, what is serious Sam? It's fast, it's running backwards, it's screaming enemies, hordes and hordes of enemies, big weapons, fast action. What if we do a turn based RPG? So we went and we pitched a turn based RPG to them and they said, Yeah, you know what? We trust your creativity. If you think that'll work, go for it. And how did that feel, by the way? Awful. Hear, awful. Yeah. <laughs> Holy, that's what can you imagine? Like you do the worst pitch you could come up with and they just go like, Yeah, okay, here's the money, go ahead. And we're just sitting there just being like, Oh no, these these guys are legit. They're they're real. They they actually just wanted to fund Okay, well, I guess we'll make the we'll make the turn-based RPG. So we ended up making the turn-based RPG. It was called Serious Sound: The Random Encounter, and it actually turned out pretty good. Like creativity does well under constraints, and having to make a turn-based RPG out of Serious Sam turns out to be a pretty spectacular constraint. Uh, that turned out that company turned out to be Devolver Digital, and we were one of their first, maybe their first signed indie game. Um, the thing about Vlambeer that is really strange in hindsight is that it was always at the place where stuff was happening. Mm-hmm. Flash, like Flash was pretty established and we got that first money, but that like tiny sort of arcade super crate box, the sort of like repeatable, um, the, 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 the reinvention of arcade that was happening right then, right? Like the conversations in the games industry is like, Games should be games again. Like narrative is, shouldn't be that important in games. And right now I look back at it and I'm like, that's a bunch of teenagers yelling about stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But back then narrative didn't mean what it does nowadays. It wasn't as refined. It was like very much people trying to shove movies into video games. And we just kind of felt that was not, not right, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so we were there. Then the move to iOS, uh, that would be, that would happen next. The move to, to publishing, uh, you know, if you're devolver pretty much defined indie publishing, let's be honest. Um, to be there at the very start of that was wild. And then, um, after that, we started on ridiculous fishing. Yeah. We, um, we had some money from Sirius Sam. We had some money from, um, Dinosaur Zookeeper. Studio was doing really well. It had been two or three years of just incredible momentum. Like everything we did turned to gold. So we decided that we would redo that flash game that it all started with, that radical fishing flash game. And we were going to do it on this new thing that was just growing uh, called iOS. That new thing that nobody had ever heard of at the time, yeah? Right, yeah. The games that were out there were like Cannibal and Solop Skier. Incredible, incredible games, but... The market was relatively young, right? It wasn't um, it wasn't what it is today. Steam had grown in the in the three years that we were making games. It had grown into like a real thing that was publishing indie games left and right. Um, so we thought Steam was getting a little busy. Let's try this mobile thing, right? And we we made a very humble pitch to ourselves. Uh, we said, uh, me and Yuvin, and we sat down and we said, we're gonna make the best iOS game ever made. Uh, because we're humble like that. Yeah, and, sounds, um, that sounds reasonable. And we uh, we looked for an iOS programmer because even though I'm I'm a pretty solid programmer, I had never worked on iOS, and you know sometimes you just gotta admit your your weaknesses. And we needed a great artist, so we reached out to Greg Woolwind, who had done um, Solid Skier. Actually, fun note: the reason we reached out to Zach because JW was very early, he was convinced about Zach. But the thing that convinced me about Zach Gage was he made a game called Lose Lose. Have you ever heard of that one? I've not. So, for anybody listening, don't download this. Um, Lose Lose is Space Invaders, right? But every enemy on the screen has a file extension, and every time you shoot an enemy, it deletes a file from your computer with that file extension. That is wildly sadistic and insidious. And really funny. Uh, <laughs> and I just love that. I love I love the con- like I love the concept. Like the statement behind it is like about the value of, of media, right? Like if you have a photo if you have a bag of photos that you've taken and somebody says, Go play space and fate, every time you kill an enemy, I will pick one from the bag randomly and burn it, you'd go like, Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. But if you do it with a computer 
and you say, I'm going to delete files, a lot of people try for high scores for some reason. So, um, so I thought that was fascinating. So we worked with Greg and we worked with Zach and we got going and three years of momentum, everything had gone right. And then the studio from San Francisco saw Radical Fishing, the Flash game, and just copied it and put it on, on uh, iOS. They changed the fisherman to a ninja. They changed the shooting to ninja fishing, uh, sorry, ninja, whatever it was called, fruit ninja. Um, but the progression was the same. The the items were the same. Everything was the same except for the art had changed a bit and they had uh, made a minor tweak to, to the game design. Well, okay, so when someone clones your game, obviously you're upset and angry. I don't mean your emotional steps, but what's your next step – in the business, like, do you, who are you calling in that case? Well, we did what we own. The only thing we could think of, which is we we got angry and sad because it turns out there's really nothing much you can do. Um, the, the reality of game development is that game design is a soft, it's a soft thing. It's not a hard thing. You can't define game design that way. And honestly, I'm thankful for that because can you imagine if Mario, if Nintendo had like, like, you know, owned jumping. Video games. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, wouldn't have been great. So uh, we we negotiated with the cloners. We said, okay, listen, we're working on a game like that, right? Like we're working on on a iOS version of the game that you're doing, uh, that you stole. Can you at least give us a chance, right? Like give us the time to finish this game. We'll go fast, and then we'll launch together. And they just kind of like kept us talking until the game launched, right? They just they just kept making like small concessions or like talking about things or like saying like, Oh, maybe we can talk about that. And then a week later the game launched and it, it launched an instant success, right? Made tons of money immediately was reviewed incredibly well for their original game design. And it, it honestly, it wrecked us. Like it, it's really hard to, to have something that you're proud of that you're working on with an amazing team. Um, and then just see somebody steal it and make tons of money off of it. Right. Yeah. So it turns out that for three years, we'd been overworking ourselves, uh, sleeping in the office, staying up late, working too much. And uh, it turns out that when you get punched in the face by life, that uh, your body has to catch up. And we had no mental energy or physical energy left. So we both burned out. Um, and, um, yeah, we didn't know what to do. So, you know, it's scary because since I was six, I'd been trying to make video games, and now I was 22, and I would stare at my laptop, and as soon as I saw my ID or my email or the blinking cursor on my screen, it was as if my head just wanted to split apart. It was a headache like never I'd felt. I'd never felt it before. I've never felt it again, thank God. Um, it was it was debilitating. Like you, I could not stare at a computer anymore and it took weeks before that went away and i think it's the you know i've been trying to do i've been trying to be a game developer since i was six and now i was here 22 i'd been successful i had a bunch of games i had a bunch of awards and i messed it up in two and a half years right mm -hmm. it's terrifying because you, you kind of worry what if you never get to do this work again mm -hmm. so at the same time flamber was running out of money uh because we weren't making games anymore uh, we were just spending money, and we didn't have a lot of money, as it being a small indie. So it looked like it was all over um, until a little Canadian studio uh, called the Hothbot reached out to us and said, hey, we saw you guys got cloned. Very sorry it happened to us as well. Can we help in any way? And they poured a super crate box to uh, iOS, which made us just enough money to keep the studio afloat. And at that point, we turned to anger. We'd been sad. We'd been like hopeless. We'd been, um, demotivated, but we hadn't gotten angry properly yet. And, and now we were angry, right? Somehow that, that little influx of money, that sort of like light at the end of the tunnel of you might pull through this had given way to, to anger. So we did the thing we were best at. I went and got really loud and JW started on a new video game. And um, the loudness involved me emailing literally, <laughs> literally anything on earth that published articles. So I emailed the New York Times, the Washington Post, Al Jazeera, like I think some newspaper in Japan, like just anything that I could find that would publish articles. 
I emailed them with the story of the little studio that got cloned. Right. And um, against all expectations, pretty much everybody ran it. Wow. Uh, everybody came out. Uh, we did interviews with the New York Times. Polygon, which is just new, was just new at that time, threw two document, uh, two documentary makers at us and like followed us around for a week and a half as we were at GDC preparing a talk about the clone. Like everybody was talking about this. And the thing we realized is that everybody was rooting for us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that everybody had seen, everybody who heard the story was rooting for us. Um, including it turned out Apple who had now learned of the reality of that story and, and, uh, was rooting for us as well. Um, so we gave a talk at GDC at the game developers conference, the biggest conference in, in, in the world for game development. And, um, basically said like that cloning should not be a thing that creativity should drive our industry. And that if, cynicism for money if the cynicism around money overtakes our ability to be creative that we shouldn't be doing this right because at that point it's all about money that sounds like some jw hipster talk right there so here's the thing the thing i realized is that the trick of money is not to become rich it's to become comfortable mm -hmm. right the healthy way of going around with money is to make sure that everybody you work with, including yourself, can comfortably live without worrying about losing their house, losing their life, losing their mortgage, not being able to feed themselves. Like that is the level of, of dignity that we all deserve. Mm -hmm. Right. What this company had done isn't that right. What this company had done is intentionally try and steal something from people that were hardworking to make a quick buck. Mm -hmm. And they would they would steal other games. It's just with ours they happened to hit on something that was really good. And right. they made lots of money. Um so my dad in the Egyptian in the Egyptian worldview, rich is just not a thing that happens. Mm -hmm. Right? Like you don't get rich. That's not a like you can get wealthy ish. Um but the the whole like the whole idea of this talk is that creativity has to come first and money has to be a resource for that. And I think I'm, I don't think I've ever disagreed with that. I just thought that JW's version was money should not be part of game development. I didn't mm. like that. I didn't like that one. That was a bit extreme for me. Gotcha. Um, cause then you can't make yourself comfortable with game development either. Right. Um, or financially comfortable with game development. Anyway, that talk, um, that talk preceded the release of Ridiculous Fishing. No, it was right after the release of Ridiculous Fishing, and it was the darndest thing. Ridiculous Fishing was, you know, you go to bed, you you hit the launch button, you go to bed. We did, like, this weird little video. We live-streamed the launch. We pressed the button live on a video, and we went to bed, and we woke up the next day, and we had money. <laughs> like... Capital, capital letter M money. Like we were not like, not like capital letter M as in millions, but like more money than I had ever considered was a reasonable amount of money. Right. Uh, and we were split across four people. And like, obviously like, it's not like we were instantly like rich, but we were instantly comfortable. And that was, right. it was wild. It was so strange. Um, to just wake up in a different life. And it, it took us a while to get used to that and, and to understand what had happened. Um, but I remember two things were happening at that point. Ridiculous Fishing launched to incredible success. It was refueled super well everywhere. And it won the Apple Game of the Year, which means we did make the best iOS game ever. Uh, yes. Yeah, um, a little, little, maybe not as ambitious or overly ambitious as we said. Right, right. Uh, it worked out. Um, the other thing is uh, Luftrausers had started because when I said JW started on a game when he was angry, the game he ended up making, the game he ended up prototyping was our, actually would be our next commercial release, Luftrausers, because mm -hmm. um, it was a really angry game, really fun. And I went to JW and I said, mate, listen, for the past like three, four years, I've been giving talks, right? And the reason I've been giving talks is because as a tiny Dutch studio, it's really hard to market your game. Uh, if the Dutch press, if the local press writes about it, 15 million people on earth, well, 18 million people on earth speak Dutch. 
that's it, right? Yeah. Well, if you go for English, if you can reach the English press, billions of people speak English. Mm -hmm. So we had to get out of the Netherlands, and we didn't have money. So somebody told me, like, hey, Rami, if you can just do some public speaking or something, I've heard that sometimes events will pay for your ticket. So I just started speaking. I started speaking at anything I could find about game development, about game design. And the talks were pretty popular, and I got invited to London. And I met some people in the international press there, and then some people uh, that were in London, some other event organized from around the world, like, got recommended my talk and then they flew me out and before I knew it I was traveling the world right the funny thing about that is I started getting these messages from people that are like Rami we heard about your talk here and there and we would love to invite you over and I'm like I'd love to come where are you and they're like in Uruguay I'm like uh is that far is that close is that that I get in, in at the bottom of, of South America. I'm like, yeah, I would love to come. Can you pay for the flight? They're like, no, we're like six developers here. They were a little bigger than that, but we're very few developers here. Mm -hmm. Like we don't have we don't have money to fund that. And I just kind of went like, okay, well then I I, I can't come. I don't I don't have money. Mm -hmm. And then Ridiculous Fishing came out, and we did have money. So I went to JW, and God bless this man's heart because even though he's an absolute hipster, like there's 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 absolute good in that attitude. I went to him and I said, listen, if I take some of the money we made with Ridiculous Fishing and I spend it on going to every place that has ever invited me that couldn't afford me, would that be okay? And he just kind of went, if we're not – he basically said if we're not earning money to do something useful with it, then what are we earning money for? Mm -hmm. That's uh, a brilliant sentiment. Really clever. And – um so I did. I went to all of those places. I met developers everywhere. And I started seeing these patterns around the world, right? Like who had the opportunity to make games, who had the who had the financial access to investment, who could reach the press, who had access to design school, like who has a community around them that they could learn from and share with. Like how do you help make those things possible for places where those things don't exist? And uh, slowly that became me right so so i want to pause just a second because this is i believe you're getting to the point now and for listeners uh when we introduced Ramy, we, we we were saying that he was an ambassador this is where it feels like that role is maybe going into full effect am i correct in thinking that yeah that would have been early 2013 yeah okay so that was weird because I was still Vlambeer, right? I was still making games. I was still working on Lift Trousers. But now, instead of being in one place, I was in every place. In 2014, I did over 100 flights, right? Which is wow, preposterous uh, and probably not very good for the environment. But we wasn't thinking of that at that time. I was just trying to be helpful. Um, mm -hmm. So I went everywhere. I got to know developers everywhere. And, and the thing I learned really quickly is that everywhere you go, you don't only teach you only you also learn mm -hmm. right so i would learn about the the cultures the history the circumstance and i would suddenly i would i would see these connections like oh the situation here in uruguay is very similar to the situation as it was in india so maybe i should connect some people and uh, i started working on on initiatives to to help people out i created a tool called press kit that indies can use to make free press kits i started uh, speaking at events like started helping events connect to interesting speakers uh, started up setting up like workshops, stuff like that. And like, can you uh, talk about press kit for a minute? Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind really, because this is a huge and essential part of the gaming industry. I see it everywhere when I'm looking right. with indie devs, but to the casual listener, they may not realize that developers need this. Right. It's really strange because you would think that, you know, I have an Apple, I have an iOS game of the year award. We've done, uh, games that made lots of money. Most of our games are sitting at like a 90 plus review score. Uh, the thing I'm best known for in the world is Prescott. Mm -hmm. Um, Prescott is, uh, it's a, it's a tool that helps developers make press kits. And the basic version is that when the press is looking to write about games, it's really hard to find good screenshots, summaries, like information about the game. And game websites aren't great for that. They're great for getting people excited or hyped or whatever, but every game's website is a little different, and you might not be able to find the things you need. So what developers normally do is they make something called a press kit, which is 
an easy to access file or page with like a short description of the game, some of the bullet points that are important to the developer, screenshots, videos, trailers, team name, release date, you know, all the important information you would need. So you can cross reference and, and get the, the right information for your, for your writing, for your video, for your live stream, whatever it is, right? Um, larger companies, do their own or have their own way of doing that. For a lot of indies, that was magic. We didn't know what went into a press kit, but I'd been working with the press for a few years and I thought I'll make a tool to make it easier for myself. And then the Octodad developers, uh, I talked to them about it and they said, hey, can we use this too? And I just went like, you know what, I'll make it public. So I made that public and it became the, it's basically the industry standard at this point, I think for press yeah. kits. <laughs> Um, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Everything from like No Man's Sky to like tiny indie games use it. Um, I, I've even seen some AAA games like use the structure of it. So the the tool I made makes a very standardized page. Like it, if you see it, you immediately need know where you need to go and what you can get there, um, which makes it really simple for the press to use and really easy for the developer to set up. So it just kind of took over and it's still the standard. Uh, to my to my shock, um, this tiny thing I made for myself is now probably the biggest thing I've ever done. Um, but is yeah, there a financial element to that for you at all? Yeah, in that the hope with press kit is that publishers would not be able to charge for doing press kits anymore. Um, so it's free. I make zero dollars off of it, but I'm pretty sure. It helped keep under control some of the things publishers were charging for. Mm. Uh, back in those days, my hope with Prescott really was that publishing, indie publishing was relatively new and it was, it could have very easily gone to a place where developers were getting exploited. And sometimes that still happens, right? Sometimes still indies end up with, with um, being exploited by publishers. But in general, I think we're at a pretty healthy place now. I'm not going to claim Prescott was responsible for that, but I like to think it helped a little mm -hmm. to like define like this is real work. This is just what's expected from somebody publishing a game. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so now Indies could do it for free. Nobody could charge for it anymore because the best solution was free. And I, I firmly believe if you want to change the world, you make something that is exceptionally good and you make it free. That will change the world because that way you can't charge for it anymore. If you want to charge for it, you have to do much better. Gotcha. That's a really cool sentiment. And I love that there's a simplicity in that. I think that is very attractive. I love think it. so too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that further consolidated that like Rami being there to help indie things happen. Mm -hmm. um, that led to lots of cool opportunities and it led to a lot of cool things that Vlambre ended up doing. Like we, or for, we were very early on in PlayStation's um, attempts to start launching indie games. Mm -hmm. uh, we helped negotiate with ID at Xbox and setting up like what ID at Xbox might look like. Uh, we spar frequently with like major platforms, with stores, with everything. Um, we accidentally led to Twitch starting a store, uh, huh. which then got shut down again. Uh, we <laughs> we we hooked up and. Um, I, 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 we were live streaming development for Nuclear Throne, which was the game we did after Lift Trousers. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized that it's really weird that when people were watching this live stream, they would have to go to the Steam store and then buy the game. Well, there was a subscription button right there, right? Right. Now, like, why can't people just buy the game with that button? So I wrote a little script that would check if you're subscribed to our channel. And if you're subscribed to our channel, it will give you a Steam key. That was this basically the twelve ninety nine subscription cost of the game, yes? One time twelve ninety nine subscription, exactly. And that you could do that back in the days. So I don't think that's still possible, but back then you could have a one time subscription fee. Yeah. Uh, I think we're one of like seven channels that still has a one time subscription. Um the um the funny part about that is that obviously we said you can now buy the game on Twitch. And then the entire Games Press went to Twitch and said like are you opening a store? Are you, we, are you selling games, right? So I got an email from Twitch PR that was just like, Rami, can you please stop saying you're selling? What are you doing? What are people talking about? What is happening? 
<laughs> we were just like, we, we um, uh, I hooked up, I, we're selling the game on Twitch, and they're like, yeah, we're gonna have you, to, we're we're gonna need you to change the wording on that. Mm-hmm. And then a few months later, we, um, they reached out to talk about how that had gone and that they were interested in starting potentially starting a Twitch store. Um, every time we were somewhere, we were somewhere where stuff, interesting stuff was happening. And it's really been one of the, the big privileges of that, of my career at Lambert was whenever things happened, we, we happened to be there. Well, let's, so you're on the forefront of all these kind of seemingly cool indie technologies and getting people spotlighted. You, you, you know, put out, you know, one of the best iOS games ever. You put out Loof Browsers, one of my favorite Vita games. Thank uh, you. You, <laughs> you do press kits. Your name is fairly well known in the indie community, uh, in the development community, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And you're using this voice, you're giving these talks, uh, to help indies be, get better recognition. But I also see you doing things like, uh, pointing out issues with, with certain ideologies in, in uh, game development and language barriers, right. uh, spotlighting different misuses of, of the Arabic language right. uh, in certain games. I'm seeing you in active in a social, almost activist space as right. well. Uh, can you talk about how those two kind of join together? Right. I mean, the, the first thing, when I grew up, right, uh, a lot of things in – in the Arab world were awful, right? Like uh, the war, the war on, on terror had just started. Um, I was 10, uh, you know, I was 10 when, when 9-11 happened mm-hmm. and Muslims and Arabs overnight became the enemies of the world, right? Like the, the Western world, like mm-hmm. overnight we were suspicious overnight. Me opening a backpack was something that people looked at a little funny, right? Overnight me pointing a remote control, at a device was scary, right? And you grow up with that, and your your my dad, who's Egyptian, kind of like teaches you that this is a thing to shut up about, right? Because if you speak up about it, you might look like you're supporting the terrorists. You might look like you're on their side. You might look like you're against us, which means you're with them, right? Um, so I learned to be quiet. I learned to be quiet, and I watched atrocity after atrocity i watched you know the arabs turn into to the bad guys overnight and then they stayed that way i traveled in 2014 i kept a website that just kept track of how often i get random checked at an airport do you fly a lot i do not i do right. not well and especially not of late <laughs> right same have you have you have you ever been random checked never once in my life i i would mm-hmm. say i've flown less than 10 times, I suppose 10 different trips. Never right. once have I been random checked. So in your life, on average, you would presumably be checked once every 20 flights. Okay. Right. That, that's about the average for, for people. I get random checks uh, almost every flight, uh, almost every single one. And a random check can vary from them opening my suitcase and asking me about specific items, uh, even when the beep or the x-ray doesn't go off. Uh, It can go as far as being stuck in an interrogation room for several hours and being grilled about who my parents are, right? Uh, Frequently, it has led to me missing flights or my flights uh, not going uh, or or not being allowed onto the flight. Uh, I've been escorted through airports by military escorts. Um, I have a lot of Arabic names, it turns out, and uh, that that apparently causes some some flags. Mm -hmm. As this was happening, I was also starting to realize that in most games I was playing, I was playing characters that look a lot like my Dutch friends, and I was shooting at people that look a lot like my Arab friends. And something felt a little off about that, right? Because I thought, well, if freedom of speech is real, right, if everybody can make things, then why am I only seeing one side? Right. Why am I only seeing the one part of the story that's about winning wars, right? Why don't I see the story about losing wars? Why don't I see the story about being invaded? Why is it always we go somewhere to bring freedom and liberty. And um, I started thinking about that. And in the back of my head, there was the words from my dad, which is, if you speak up about this, it will, it will harm you. It will hurt you. It won't help anybody. It will just cause harm to you. And then slowly and slowly, my reach and my voice in the industry grew. And at some point, I just felt it was inappropriate to not use my voice to at least call these things out. 
right? Yeah. At some point you realize like if I am quiet, then I am falling short of the responsibility that a platform like that gives you. At that point I had a hundred thousand followers on Twitter. People in the industry listened to me. I spoke around the world. I was one of the, if not the only visible Arab Muslim in games, right? Um, the only one with the voice that I have now. Um, and most critically, my voice was heard in the industry. A lot of people in games, when they get visible, they get loud towards the audience, right? They get heard by the audience. They're the famous developers, right? But my role in the industry is entirely different. I Sure, there's a lot of people that still know of me because they follow the games industry, but most people that know me, they're not necessarily gamers, they're game developers. Right? Those are the people that tend to be interested in what I do. And I thought... I, I, I'm, I'm interrupting you only to say that is quite seriously why I wanted to have you on this show, is, is I don't know that... The, the, the other side knows you. It's the developer right. side. Right. That's, wow. It, it's I, really I, I fascinating. No, but it's it's really fascinating because there's not a lot of people that have had that opportunity. There's definitely no Arabs and there's definitely no Muslims that ever had that opportunity. And I thought, okay, so I've seen around the world, right? And I've seen the disadvantages of the language barrier of growing up without English, of not having access to big funds or big schools or having the Microsoft office in your back in your backyard. Um being able to travel, right, without a visa, uh, being able to travel at low cost, right? A, a ticket from middle of U.S. to San Francisco for GDC is a few hundred dollars. If you go from the Central African Republic, it's the equivalent. It would feel to you and me like $35,000, which is impossible, right? Yeah. Wow. Um, so as I started seeing those things, I realized that, if anybody was going to speak up about it, it would have to be me because I was pretty much the only developer that had done that travel. I was the only indie that had gotten the privilege of making money and had the ability of traveling around the world and thus had the, the wanted to do the effort of making things more fair because in the back of my head was this idea that I was only seeing games from one voice, from one place, from the West, right? Where were all these other games? I had Japan that was there and Japanese games were so different. They were so cool. I loved, I love Japanese games because you could tell that they came from somewhere else. Right. Right. You can, you can just feel it. You can feel the difference between a Japanese game and a Western game. And then I started thinking like, what if, what if people in other places around the world had the same access to money, to, to resources, to opportunity as the developers that we always see. And I, it just kind of became my mission, right, to try and make that happen. Even if I have to do it very slowly, even, take, even if it takes me the rest of my life, I think that with the platform I have, it would just be irresponsible to not point out these wonderful games being made around the world because you can tell that they're different. You know, the, the war games I talked about, right, uh, the Call of Duties and the, the Medal of Honors, mm -hmm. those are Western specifically usually American war games. And the American attitude towards war is that war is war is bad, right? I think most of us agree that war is bad. Mm -hmm. yes. War is something that people go to, your children go to, your, your father goes to, your family goes to, and then they might not come back, mm -hmm. right? And then the goal of the war is to win the war to protect American interests abroad, to protect freedom, to protect democracy, right? That's mm -hmm. the story. So the American attitude towards war, the cultural attitude towards war is one of the worst thing that can happen is you die, right? You don't go right. back home. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the best thing that can happen is you win the war. And overall, structurally, the worst thing that can happen is the bad guys win the war because then bad things happen in the world. Nukes go off or terrorists take over. Or, so that's kind of the story. And if you look at American war games, that's the story that gets told over and over and over again, whether it's in the Second World War or in modern warfare. It's a cultural attitude towards war. Now, if you would think of a German game about war, the German attitude towards war is very different, right? The Germans have been traumatized by war because when war happened, they were not only the aggressor frequently, uh, at least for the Second World War, they definitely were, um, but also destruction came to their own land. Right. Destruction came to their 
to, to, to the people there, whether they were supporting the Nazi party or not is completely independent. Germany was destroyed pretty much. Mm -hmm. And with it came a life of uh, a culture of shame towards war. So when the Germans made a game about war, they made Spec Ops the line. Right. Which is completely different. Very and I, different. And now you can take it one step further. If you go to, like, Poland, there's a studio there called 11-Bit. Now, Poland is not a country that goes to war. It's a country that war comes to. Right? Mm -hmm. So their attitude towards war, they were the first hit by the by the Nazi regime in, in the Second World War. Um, their attitude towards war in the region was very much about war comes to our lands and we survive it. So when they make a game about war, they make this war of mine. Right. Yes. So in every game, whether you want it or not, every game you make, there's a fingerprint. There's a fingerprint of the people that made it, the culture that it was made in, the history that they lived, the culture that they have. My games, I didn't know it. My games are extremely Dutch design. Dutch design is minimalist. It's a little self-deprecating or humoristic about the shape it's in. Uh, and it's functional. Mm -hmm. Look at Lambert games and... I was shocked, but there it is. That's exactly, and I had no idea that that aesthetic had snuck into my work because to me, that's just what good art looks like. It's just right. what good games look like. It's like, yeah, this is this makes sense to me. This is elegant. It is beautiful, right? But then you start wondering, okay, so if this fingerprint is unique for everyone and we're looking at war games, right? And we're seeing like, okay, we have all these fascinating, honestly, I, I love shooter games and I, I tend to love war games. Um, you have all these fascinating, spectacular shooters, and that's the American version of war, right? Now let's look at the German version of war, and it's this thoughtful, considerate, like, exposition on, like, trauma and, like, hurt and um, and responsibility and grief. And then you have the Polish version. It's this very tense, very dark, very grim story of survival and sacrifice. And you're just like, what other fingerprints are we missing, right? Which stories are out there waiting to be told in a video game? that we haven't seen yet because those people have not had the ability to tell that story yet. Like why was the Witcher from a small Polish studio so much richer in its cultural context than a lot of other RPGs at the time, right? Why is, why is a game from a specific place the way it is? And for me, that, that is the central question for me is if we, to me, there's no question in my mind that the more people around Earth have the same ability to make games, the more incredible games we'll see, right? New attitudes, new perspectives, new twists on genres, entire new ways of interacting, puzzles that we've never seen. Instead of, like, rolling a thing over a pressure plate, again, nothing wrong with a pressure plate. Don't get me wrong. But, like, what puzzle mechanics haven't I seen? Because I came across a puzzle game from Iran by a kid who was not a game, like not a professional game developer, just doing it for a hobby. And I had never seen the mechanic before. Just never, it blew my mind because you kind of go like, we've kind of seen everything, right? Mm -hmm. And just entirely new. And I was just shocked, shocked. Mm -hmm. that he wasn't even aware that this was something like brilliant. Uh, and I asked him, how did you do it? And he's like, well, I wanted to make a game about rolling up carpets. I'm like, why? He's like, because we roll up carpets. <laughs> And, you know, when you see that, you can't stop wanting to fight for that. You can't stop wanting to protect that. Games, I truly believe games are something special, right? That they are unlike anything else. That Because, and this might be a little long-winded, but I believe games are not the start of something. They're a continuation of something much bigger, right? When humanity first stood on its two feet, right? You you might have had two types of people, right? You might have had the people that were very self-serious and they would only throw a rock at something if it was trying to kill them or they were trying to kill it. And they had the playful ones that would just throw a rock at a tree because let's see if we can hit that tree, right? Mm -hmm. They would climb a tree not because they needed to to survive, but because it was fun to climb a tree, right? Um, they were playful. And I believe that those that were playful, that they survived longer because they got better at throwing that rock and they got better at climbing that tree, right? And I think everything about humanity started from playfulness. And sure, it was functional, but somebody had to make a sound 
for somebody else to go like, okay, let's agree that that means cow. Right? Right, yes. So language evolved that way. And music presumably evolved that way. Everything about our, our species, everything about our culture evolved from somebody doing something that wasn't according to the rules, that wasn't according to the expectations, just because they could, right? And our survival depended on that. So in my belief, playfulness sort of evolved into our species as a positive trait, as a thing we want to do. And that's why across history, from the ancient Egyptians making Senate all the way to now, us playing video games, play has been a staple of human culture. It has been at the heart of human culture. And as game developers, we've just been given that torch. We've just been given that torch of play. But the thing that gets me about play is that no matter where I go, if I have a ball in my hand, right, a baseball, or if a soccer ball and I put it on the ground, and I kick it at you or I throw it at you, what do you do? Uh, trap it or catch it. Right. And then what do you do next? Probably kick it or throw it back. Exactly. If you spoke a different language, would that have changed? Uh, if I spoke in, in the sense, no, 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 it would not no. have changed. No. Right. It doesn't matter what language you speak, right? It doesn't matter right. at all. It doesn't matter what language I speak. So play is a language. It's a global language. Everybody understands play. You don't have to understand any English word to be able to play Call of Duty. Right? right. When I was playing games back back when I was a kid, Pokemon came out in Japanese in emulators because I was illegally playing games. Don't, you know, uh, I didn't have money. Um, but it was the Japanese version. I couldn't understand the word, and still I finished Pokemon. Right? Because I just learned these, these, these characters, they mean that the water animation happens, and then the other Pokemon health bar goes from green to yellow. So even though I didn't understand the word, I still understood Pokemon. Still understood the rules of the game, and I just wanted the blue, the blue turtle guy, whatever his name was, uh, Squirtle. I know now, but um, if play is a global language, then I think not only should everybody be able to listen to it, I think everybody should be able to speak it. Right? Everybody should have the opportunity to make video games, to tell their culture, to give us these unique game ideas that are out there that we haven't seen before. You know what? I think that would be a pretty good use of a life, right? It is. So cool to hear you saying this because I'm thinking about multiple things as you're describing this idea of play. I'm thinking about uh, as young children learning, like like in education, young kids, very young kids will be banging on pots and pans and walking around and running into things as they learn their world. And they're often doing it, finding joy and whatnot. And the easiest way to kill that is uh, in education uh, to make it systemic, right? To, to right. Hey, be quiet, don't hit that, don't make noise, sit here, do this, learn your music. Whereas they were making acoustic experiments and, and playing in order to learn that. Right. And then the other, the other part of the thing that you're, you're saying is about giving it to more people, finding more people around the world with the chance to, to play and to create in order to play. And in order to pick up that torch, they need access to things and, uh, the developers in Uruguay and whatnot, and and you know tra traveling around the world in different parts of Africa, and and I'm tying those ideas of giving people a chance to a lot of the conversations that have been happening in America in the last few years about representation, not just in games, but in uh, equality of the law, in in equity of uh, resources, and it's just right. it's funny. There's a much bigger message in this idea of, right. of video games. Which is which is why you've seen me become louder about those things because that same that same realization dawns dawned on me over the past few years that what I'm speaking about is not the part of the world that I can affect right that I can meaningfully affect is games, but I don't believe that games have to be just a product of the culture right they will always be a product of the culture but I also believe that nowadays especially with the world is now games are Part of the culture they are how we teach people they are how we understand the world i remember more of playing the age of empires campaign than i remember of my history classes right sure. and i yeah. loved history but my god did i play a lot of age of empires um games are how we how we look at the world right they are part of how we express ourselves as as creatives and as such they're a reflection of our culture but with the reach they have now they also shape how our culture goes, how people, how kids play Minecraft will affect their worldview forever. How they play Fortnite will affect their worldview forever. 
Is it in like big, like complex ways? No, but can tiny things lead to big things? Well, the same way my kindergarten teacher gave me a chessboard. Yeah, there's infinite potential in, in even small touches to a human life. So I think for me, I can only change the world in games. And I'm comfortable with that because I think games change the world. And if I can change a little bit in games, then maybe I can make the world a little better. Um, Asmel, that is the perfect place to end, my friend. That is a brilliant and beautiful sentiment. Uh, thank you for taking the time uh, to spend with me this afternoon, your evening, I would imagine. Right. Uh, but uh, more than that, uh, I'm just appreciative of the lessons and the, the goodwill you're putting out into the industry. Uh, I'll ask you one last thing. Uh, where would you like people to find you and what work would you like to point them towards? The um, the easiest way to find me and anything I do is honestly on Twitter. It's T-H-A underscore Rami, R-A-M for Mary, and then I. Um, most things I do, I link on there. So easiest way to find me. And any upcoming projects or talks or anything of that nature you'd like them to put their eyes towards? Oh, gosh, I have so many things brewing right now. But the, the biggest thing I would say is if anybody in this chat, uh, you know, listening to this chat thought, hey, this game development thing sounds good, or, hey, I've been trying to be a developer, but I'm a little stuck. On my Twitter, you'll also find a way to reach out. And if you have any questions, if you want to be a developer, please let me know.